Hi there, folks. Thanks again for your time today as well. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to present to you all and to the volunteers for making it happen. Um, before we introduce ourselves, I'd like to pose a question to the audience here. How many of us in this room full of security enthusiasts has been the victim of account compromise, phishing, stuff like that? I was really nervous when I thought I was going to ask this question because I had no idea how many people would put their hand up. But actually, it looks to be, roughly speaking, about a, like a third, maybe 40% of the room. The rest of them know it yet. But... Maybe no, maybe so, right? And I think the interesting, here, the interesting part of this is like we're a hardened target, right? And if you can imagine if we asked this question in a, in a room full of folks who are maybe not as enthusiastic about security as we are, um, that number is likely going to be significantly high. Um, so we're here to kind of talk about a pretty common attack vector nowadays um, that we still see kind of happening in, in pretty large scale in the wild. Um, it's worth noting that the detections we'll be talking about here are um, possible and commercially available tools, open source, and there's nothing specific to the company here. Um, but in the interests of like furthering both the red and the blue sides of the proverbial coin, um, we're going to look for basically looking through the needle, looking for the needle in the kind of like log haystack. So just to introduce myself quickly, I'm Troy. Um, I'm originally from South Africa. I've spent most of my life in the UK and Australia. I've been in the industry for about 13, 14 years, something like that. About nine of those years I was in red teaming before about four years ago I joined uh, Google's blue team. And I'm Kathy. I work with Troy here in the detection space at Google. I have worked in the security industry for about a decade, and currently I'm a security engineering tech lead. Professionally, my passion is in detection engineering and solving complex problems with coding. Outside of work, I love running, love the outdoors, and reading books. Back to you. Thank you. So just quickly to cover the agenda, we'll first be talking about um, some typical attacker motivations that we see targeting credentials, why they target credentials, what they're used for. We'll talk about some credential fundamentals for those of you who may not be familiar with some of this stuff, you know, what they are, what they represent, how, and what we know about them, and how we can use this to our advantage. Then we'll go into the majority of our talk, which is talking about detection patterns that we use to detect credential abuse, um, and including some controls that we can support us doing so as well, and some of the challenges involved in this. For those of you in blue teaming roles, some of these might, might sound quite familiar. Finally, we'll talk about what we can do after a detection has fired, um, and what we need to be aware of when investigating to help us respond and actually remediate the incident when it happens. And we'll hopefully have some time for questions at the end, but if not, we'll be hanging around outside, so please feel free to ask us outside as well. But when we talk about credential compromise, we need to remember that credential compromise really means account compromise. And account compromise can be used for many, many things, including you know, spam or abuse campaigns, uh, ransomware scams, social engineering more generally, or in like the more sophisticated instances, you'll see like initial foothold in target organizations, like lateral movement, privilege escalation, all these kinds of like really bad things. As you can imagine, for an attacker, this is like a highly sought after um, set of accesses, right? Some of you might remember Lapsus, the group that used to, um, and I guess maybe still does, um, purchase credentials as a form of initial access, um, amongst other things. It's worth noting that this approach is not necessarily lower sophistication, because even though you have the creds, you still have to be able to ma maintain operational security, to ma maintain stealth, um, because just because you're in the front door doesn't mean no one's looking for you. Another highly relevant case from June last year, um, Storm 0558 or 558, um, a China attributed APT group that targeted Microsoft and gained access to consumer account signing keys. Uh, these were then used to create credentials for specific high value end user Outlook accounts and subsequently compromise those accounts. And attacks like these are highly, highly sophisticated and often require the, the backing of nation states or similar due to the, the resource investments required. And due to this high investment cost, the targets are often sig of, of significant importance to the attacker. And hence why we see these kind of like high investment um, high value capabilities being burned to gain access here. And finally, many APT and cybercrime cyber crime groups, sorry, also abuse credentials to a variety of means as well, including things like you know, crypto scams via social engineering, vote manipulation using large volumes of targeted accounts, stuff like this. Um, but the really important thing here is to remember that a lot of these groups operate as a business and they need to have a return on their investment. So as defenders, Detecting the attack attacker trying to do this sort of stuff really means we need to be looking at, first of all, credential theft, um, the attacker stealing a legitimate credential issued to a legitimate user and using it to typically compromise the account that we talked about before. Uh, credential sharing in sale, an attacker purchasing a user's credentials or the user voluntarily sharing their credentials with an attacker. Um, in many ways, this is similar to the credential theft problem, but it has one important nuance which we'll talk about during the investigation process. And finally, credential forgery, 
which is an attacker really compromising key material, as I mentioned a minute ago, to generate arbitrary credentials out of band of the identity providing system. Or more generally speaking, just being able to generate credentials without actually being the IDP. And just a note, we won't talk, touch on the credential exfiltration here, because that's like a subset of the detection of exfiltration problem, which is like an entire field in itself. But at this point, I'll hand over to Kathy to talk about some credential speedrunning basics. No, speedrunning credential basics. Even. Okay, so before diving into the details of the detections, we'll take a step back and do a walkthrough of the credential basics, like Troy mentioned. So credentials can be a bunch of things depending on the context. For example, we see passwords, hardware multifactor auth tokens, browser cookies, auth tokens, certificate backed, cryptographic signing keys, and the list goes on. More generally, credentials can be uh, considered to be something that that is used to provide, well, used to prove one's identity and tend to be unique. Some credentials can also be used to derive or exchange for other credentials. For example, you log into a website with a username and password, maybe an MFA challenge as well. The website gives you a cookie, which you then use in subsequent requests during that session rather than providing your password and MFA challenge every single time. Similarly, a refresh token issued to a client can be used to exchange short-lived um, access tokens. These are all examples of credential exchanges. Important point to bear in mind, credentials can be used to attest one's identity and by extension their access as well. As credentials not only act like a badge or ID that proves identity, but also act like a key that can be used for unlocking access. So if a malicious actor managed to steal your credential and then there aren't good controls in place, then they can attest your identity and obtain sensitive access. And finally, credentials generated for users and identities are related. One can have lots of credentials linked to their identity. We can often computationally build a model of this relationship using log data containing different contexts of, their, uh, of these credentials. This relationship is often the key to join seemingly unrelated data source and piece together the full picture for both detection and investigation. So when it comes to building detections for credential abuse, it's also important to understand some of the common properties that can be leveraged to enable such detections. Here are some of the things we know about credentials. Firstly, the trust we can bestow in a credential is positively correlated to the strength of the challenges, which needs to be met for credential to be issued. For example, we shouldn't think you know password to be like a strong form of credential we have all seen the password bad meme the user generated single factor unbound values so we can't trust passwords by themselves but we can bestow higher amount of trust to credentials that have stronger authentication challenges and controls although we should keep in mind that there could be legitimate reasons why the weak credentials are still supported for example dated software backward compatibilities etc and secondly, many credentials we look to secure rarely leave the context upon which they were generated. This context could be a browser for a cookie, for example, a device or a TPM, a trusted platform module for those who are not familiar with the term. Um, they, there are exceptions, of course. For example, credentials such as passwords or bearer tokens, uh, they are oftentimes intended to be transportable, but many credentials um, rarely leave the original context they were generated from and therefore can leverage that for our detection. Credentials are also rarely accessed outside of a specific set of executables. For example, cookie jars are only accessed by browsers most of the times. But if you see a random binary cock.exe accessing your cookie jar, then there's something wrong. Another example of this could be we see many executables signed by the same certificate accessing a corp credential, and all of a sudden an unsigned credential is accessing it. This will stand out. Aside from password, passkeys, MFA, many credentials also rarely get accessed by end users. Typically, access to credentials are automated or performed by a program. Although human access is not impossible, it can be interesting in the context of other detections as well. 
Okay, so before we start talking about how to use these properties to implement credential abuse detections, I would also like to address a very important prerequisite. We need to talk about logs. We cannot talk about detections without emphasizing this point. Logs are extremely important, a crucial precursor to everything we're about to talk about. Going forward, we'll, we'll be assuming we have good log availability and access. We have the ability to ingest filter and detect maliciousness within a reasonable time frame or latency. We're not going to talk about how this can be done as this is not a detection pipeline talk, but we can chat about this afterwards if folks in the room are interested. Okay, so just to reiterate the points, the main takeaway here is your first step shouldn't be try to implement the detections. It should be making sure your logs do what you need them to do. As your detections are only as good as the data is built off, you know, following the garbage in, garbage out principle, you'd want your pipeline to log the right things, reliably log the right things, retain these data for a reasonable time frame, make these logs available for ingestion, and tell you when these things aren't working as intended. Obviously, this requires resource, compute, memory, and disk space to enable, but they are very important to build reliable detections. Okay, I'll pass to Troy to talk about credential abuse detections now. Awesome, thanks. Uh, but all this being said, let's talk about um, how we can use what we know about credentials and, and how attackers can use them to, to try and detect some badness. So credential theft often manifests itself as some kind of identity impersonation, uh, compromise of a user account, something along these lines. Uh, and there's many, many vectors through which credentials can be stolen. This is commonly the result of things like info stealing malware, um, of which there are many, many variants every day and, and an even greater number of infections that we see around the world. But it also could be things like cross-site scripting, um, dumping and exfiltration of credential databases, all these kinds of things that effectively result in credentials ending up in places we don't want them to be. Um, we won't be talking about all possible variations of detecting credential abuses. There's a lot of it, as you can imagine. Uh, we're talking about um, a couple of examples, including the impossible travel problem, which a lot of people might be familiar with, um, credential binding violations, and also discussing uh, credential forgery as well, um, which is similar in terms of impact um, on the end user accounts here, but very different in nature when it comes to detection engineering. Um, whoop, that was too fast. So to talk about impossible travel. So for those of you who haven't kind of experienced this much before, let's say we have a user that's normally based in Bogota in Colombia. That's their main working location. This is where we see them appear from in log data and where we see their devices talk to our infrastructure where they originate from. Hypothetically, after a period of time, we then see authenticated user traffic originating from Seattle. The question becomes, is it possible for, for a human to feasibly travel between these two locations within the time frame that we've seen? This essentially boils down to a question of how fast would they have to travel to get from A to B, and is their velocity above what we would consider possible in that time frame? For example, the velocity of a commercial passenger aircraft is, is probably fine within reason, but if we see people traveling beyond the speed of sound, unless you're in a very specific set of jobs, you're probably not going to be doing that regularly. But remember that all of these observations and speed calculations come from log data, as Kathy mentioned a second ago. We need ways of determining where the user is appearing from, first of all. This is kind of this concept of geolocation. IP address is probably the most common means of figuring this out, generally speaking. But if we see the user in two places when looking at IP indicators, there could be many other legitimate reasons why this happens. Things like VPN usage, for example, is the most common one. And remoting it to devices somewhere else, or geolocation attribution sometimes changing on a given IP address block because this is just how the internet works. So we need to move beyond just, did we see a low fidelity indicator present? And we can't really solely rely on IP addresses. We, and we really want to try and figure out where the real user actually is based on the other indicators that we see. So password is unfortunately also a weak indicator. Things like, you know, fishable credentials that are designed to be somewhat portable for the user. If we see a user authentication event and all, we, all they provide is a password, we can't really say for certain that it's the real user actually at the keyboard. And this is particularly due to the portab portability of passwords uh, and their fishability. Soft back M backed MFA creds, things like SMS security codes, for example, are slightly better, um, particularly if we see them in combination with other factors, passwords and security codes. This is like the concept of two-factor authentication nowadays, basically. But again, SMS things and, and like soft backed security codes are designed to be portable again and reasonably fishable. And some of these are vulnerable to out-of-band attacks like SIM porting. The effectiveness of soft um, MFA tokens really depends on the specific token type, and these can be quite varied, which makes it quite hard.
But we might be able to determine, for example, that a company-owned device is present at a given location if a hardware-backed credential issued to a device is used as a second factor, or if we issue users with hardware MFA tokens, YubiKeys, for example, or if our infrastructure requires the use of mutual TLS with a certificate that's stored in the TPM. This at least suggests some kind of legitimate, strongly attested factor is present, but it still doesn't mean the real user is there. Stolen devices, credential sale, um, which we'll talk about shortly, all of these are situations where we might not see the real user at the keyboard here. And we kind of need biometrics to be sure, almost, which I'll talk about in a sec. But finally, observing the same session-based credentials used from two devices or two IP addresses at the same time is typically a strong uh, indicator for account compromise. Session-based credentials, things like cookies, for example, typically are not designed to be transferable between devices. So why would you see them moving? That's the real question you have to ask. So when we see an event take place where indicators like these are present, we need to figure out like, you know, which indicators do we see of geolocation and of user device presence? How confident are we in their fidelity, their portability, their transferability? What activity do we see before and after the event? And does any of this seem strange? Um, and do we have other log sources from which we can enrich this data? Did the user badge in recently to an office, for example? If so, was that office location near one of the locations we see them in log data? And combining a bunch of these indicators can give us a, a pretty good idea of where the user really is, uh, and therefore may, may have happened to trigger a detection like this. But this is really dependent on the indicators that we see and what we know about the user. And this changes our confidence level in the detection itself and also how we investigate it. But again, the effectiveness of this detection, this detection pattern, the impossible travel problem, uh, depends on another variety of factors. For example, we want to be able to correlate as many log sources as possible. The, this, we really want like strong log diversity, you can think of this as, where we have as many relevant indicators as present, are present across as many log types as we can. Because the more logs that we have, the more diverse data points we can geolocate and calculate the distance between. This gives us, generally speaking, a higher fidelity signal. Otherwise, we heavily limit our visibility to the specific log sources that we choose, and the attacker just may hide in one of the ones we're not looking in. Similarly, but kind of almost inversely, we want high log granularity. We want as many event types to be logged for any given log type. And this means that the more events that we have for a given log, the more geolocation indicators that we can compute. And we can compute the signaling more frequently and with higher, um, higher fidelity. But there is a trade-off here. The biggest problem is the more stuff that you log, the more stuff you ingest. This basically means the more thing you have to account for in your detection logic. And the more expensive things become. You have to store a hell of a lot more information. So implementing a good detection here gets increasingly complex, um, both in time and resources. But even beyond all of these indicators, it's important to consider the context of the events that we see. Firstly, we need to consider the devices we know the user might use. For example, um, in traffic routing terms, mobile devices over mobile networks um, or NAT gateways at wi -Fi, on Wi-Fi networks at home, general mobile roaming um, network routing, um, all of these things affect user attribution and geolocation accuracy. Users also express different behaviors from mobile devices, for example, in comparison to desktops or laptops. And some devices just might fundamentally not support the security features we need for some of this stuff. Some things may not have a TPM, for example. We may not be able to have hardware back credentials. It's also typically rare to see multiple concurrent active sessions on multiple devices. Most of the time, people will use one device at a time interactively. They may flip between two in very quick succession if you have two laptops next to you, for example. Um, but they'll typically have one main device, and this won't be for a very long time. So that's to say that observing two concurrent, fully interactive sessions from different devices should, should almost definitely arise suspicion, uh, particularly if this happens over a long period of time. And it can be hard to determine interactive here, but it's possible within reason. Um, but the fundamental question here really still comes down to how can we be sure that it is the actual user at the keyboard at the location where we see them? Or more specifically, how can we be sure that it's the actual user expressing the credentials that we see? User behavior and attacker behavior, for those of you in red teaming roles will know, are very, very similar, um, depending on the role of the user. And we can tune our detection output to any volume we like, almost. And we need to consider the volume that we can deal with, either manually or through automation. Those in blue team roles might be very familiar with noisy detections being tuned based on capacity rather than accuracy. And the challenge, this is also a challenge here in the impossible travel problem, um, unless we have the right data, the right enrichments, the right automation um, to tune this stuff appropriately. And for those of you in red team roles, um, this is where the attacker really wants to blend into the noise. 
they want to be able to blend into that volumetric tuning limitation of this detection pattern. And as blue team, as we also need to consider this angle when we investigate these events. But we also need to be considerate of the user. We don't want to inconvenience the user with unnecessary reme remediative act actions, or we risk them circumventing controls that are too cumbersome. But those strongly backed credentials, those MTLS certificates, UB keys, and things like it we mentioned before, can help us answer some pretty important questions. For example, as we talked about briefly, did we see any company-issued devices to present at a given source IP address? If so, we need to consider the context of what happened. A company device being seen at a given IP address might suggest that this is the user's home IP address location, for example, or their typical working location. Or at least that someone in that location has access to a company-issued device. Note that may not be the real user. This could be an attacker, could be a family member, could be almost anyone. If not, we need to consider the credentials that we see, how these are issued, and how they're stored on the device. But this can also help us answer a question of, do we see evidence of human presence at a given source IP address? Observing human presence from IP addresses that are geographically far apart is the, effectively the essence of this detection pattern of the impossible travel problem. But again, we need to attest user identity to be 100% sure, within reason, of, of who's actually there. Because human presence can be attested more easily than attesting the real user identity that might be present at the location. Usage of second factor tokens that aren't biometric, login activities using fishable or transferable credentials, interactive net flow or process logs on the device, these are all signs of human behavior. They may be automation as well, to be fair. You can pretty normally figure that out quite easily, but it's not actually the real user. You can't be sure from logs. Which, although it is a more difficult question to answer, we now come to our final question of, can we determine which of the active sessions is the real user, the person we issued the credential on the device to? If we have biometric hardware-backed second factor authentication here, this can be pretty conclusive in determining what's going on, um, specifically that we can know within reasonable bounds which session is likely the real user. But this also has caveats when it comes to enrollment. We can also interdict user processes with additional biometric checks, things like selfie verification, for example. But ML models are getting really good at rendering video, and you can imagine the application of that there. But effectively, determining real user presence typically com comes down to the best possible combinations of trade-offs and limitations in the impossible travel detection problem. And it's worth noting that for non-biometric hardware second factors, we, we can't make the same attestation here. We could only state that a human was present at a given location. But we'll talk more about this when we talk about credential sharing and sale. But to summarize the points on the impossible travel detection problem real quickly, um, if you find yourself implementing or investigating the output of one such detection like this, Try and combine as many indicators as you can and weight them as appropriate. Some logs are going to be more relevant than others. We want to filter out known background activity and or noise where you can, um, because we don't want those things to trigger impossible travel events. And as a result, you don't need to ingest everything. But we want to try and avoid shooting a detection like this for triage capacity, because it's much better to implement better touch detection logic and noise reduction and enrichment so we can actually outscale the attacker rather than just burdening ourselves with toil. We should also consider how much trust we place in credentials that we can see being presented. If we see high trust credentials and we got confident in their security posture, we might be able to imply a given session as the real user within reason. We also need to consider geolocation granularity and maximum velocity. You might have to ask this question of like, how far does someone have to travel for this detection to fire, given how accurately we can measure geolocation? And how fast do we think is too fast? Some cases may be fundamentally too fast, like in our Bogota to Seattle example. But some may be just unreasonable, like unreasonable, sorry, like for someone who would fly from Manhattan to Newark, this is probably not going to happen in, in real life. Sometimes it might be better just to ask the user what happened if you aren't sure. Um, often if we aren't sure, it's just easier to ask to understand the weirdness. But there's caveats with this, which we'll talk about shortly as well. But it's also generally worth trusting gut instinct. From what we know of the user, their role within the company, their likely work times and locations, is this likely to be them? You can kind of normally figure this out. Although blending into the noise as is a thing, um, attacker behavior does generally stand out, again, with, with a massive set of assumptions there. So instinct and Occam's razor can help make these gut decisions a lot of the time. It's also worth keeping in mind the limitations of impossible travel detections. Um, unless session-based credentials are available, available as indicators here, the detection itself is going to be heavily dependent on geolocation changes to a user's account. And we talked about how some of those are better than others, and also some of the challenges there as well. And finally, in practice, as coverage of detection increases, uh, so does the noise level. 
And it's important to complement the detection with additional controls, for example, credential binding, which I'll hand back over to Kathy to discuss. All right, so as Troy just mentioned, credential binding is a great control to complement credential abuse detections. So this links to a property mentioned previously. Some credentials we look to secure should rarely leave the context upon which they were generated. And if we can bind a credential to a context, for example, device, we can, in theory, detect its theft when it leaves that context and get presented back to us. So let's take a closer look at how credential binding works. Say so we have a identity provider, IDP, and a client where a user wants to authenticate by a client and get the credentials they can sub subsequently use, for example, a cookie. We have some binding conditions configured that we want to enforce. We need to compute the binding criteria when we receive their authentication data, generate the credentials we want to return, and then apply our binding criteria and log the credential generation event and then return these bound credentials to the client. And when a user try to use the bound credentials, they would present these credentials back to the IDP when, um, and then the IDP then compute the binding criteria again, check that our computation matches those present in the, uh, <laughs> check that our computation matches um, the bind the the bind the binded criteria that's present in the credential or presented by the authentication client, and then make a decision of whether the credential binding control has been met. And in this case, um, because it's a legitimate client, let's assume it has, and log the credential usage event with the binding control validation result, and then return the data or content to the user as requested. But in the case where these credentials were stolen or used from a different malicious device, for example, we still do the same thing, compute the binding criteria again, check the criteria, make a decision, and then log the event. But in this case, as you can imagine, the control will not validate and we'll, we will be logging a violation of the binding control. And this is the event that we look for in our logs when we write our detections. And then we would like some sort of actions to be taken to remediate the situation. We might expire the suspicious session, lock the user out, lock false re-authentication. There are false positive use cases here too. For example, um, like a user might accidentally back up their device and, or re-image their device and get issued a different certificate that doesn't match the existing binding, but it is their credential they're trying to use. Uh, it's important to consider these edge cases um, when developing detections. And similarly to our impossible travel data points, there are a variety of binding mechanisms to consider, although the usefulness of these controls might vary depending on the context and their use cases. So starting from the top, we can bind a client-side credential to a machine certificate, for example, that is backed by a TPM. This is a strong binding as it is non-trivial for the attacker to retrieve and lift data from a TPM remotely. TLS channel binding is an alternative mitigation which could also be highly effective. Channel bound credentials are bound to the underlying TLS session. For example, cookies may be channel bound or all tokens can be channel bound. With cha channel binding, leaked or stolen credentials cannot be used in the attacker's session. The attacker must compromise the victim's browser session directly. Both the top two options, um, they protect against credentials taken out of the original context and used elsewhere. However, they don't protest against abuse from the compromised device or session directly. And a compromised credential may be exchanged for a new unbound credentials that can be used elsewhere. This is not foolproof, but it's highly effective to spot a, a, a class of attack. And next we have IP addresses and net blocks. Attacker in possession of a credential needs to be in the same IP address range or originate from the same IP address from where the credential was generated to make use of the credential. We can detect, you know, offset mistakes basically um, very easily using this approach. But there are a lot of options for the attacker to bypass this um, binding, like using VPNs or large retail ISP ranges. Specific IP address might be a bit harder, but not impossible, depending on the circumstance as well. 
And finally, we will have time. It can be considered as a binding control in the form of an expiration window. Unbound credentials can be expired to mitigate the impact of any potential compromise. Having said that, time in general is a weak binding control. This is where we see a lot of credentials, targeted per credentials theft today. And automation can be easily used to bypass time windowing as well. So we just talked about controls that try to prevent credentials from leaving the original context. To leverage these controls for detection, it is important to understand why a binding control was engaged in the first place. If a binding control fires, this implies the credential has been moved, moved elsewhere. We can mitigate this by forcing the user to log out, but it, we should still know why did this happen and investigate it. Um, it could be a malware-infected laptop, for example, or it could be just user procuring a credential for an attacker. We never know until we look. It is important to remember that the attacker can easily try again. Uh, so just because we mitigated this one time, we need to make sure we keep the cost high for the attacker per iteration as well. We've been talking in depth about credential theft. So far, it's time to talk about a similar threat, credential sharing and sale. This technically is not a standalone detection pattern, but nonetheless an augmentation of what we've discussed so far. The difference is complicity and intent. In the case of credential sharing or sale, the user is likely complicit. This means we need to consider intent in our investigation. Someone might be sharing the credential so they can get access to a personal doc saved on their corp account uh, because their family member, they're traveling and their family member is still at home. They could also be sharing their credential because they have sold them. Post abuse context enrichment is very important here. Ideally, we should find out what actually happened after the credential were used in an unexpected manner. Um, and also biometric hardware-backed MFA tokens are very useful here. If we see evidence of a hardware-backed biometric token used, this is a strong indicator that the user is either present or complicit. Note, if a user is complicit, we also need to be careful during our investigation and response. First, we need to consider when and how to reach out to the user. This can be a very sensitive discussion. Don't, en don't underestimate your time investment. Um, be especially conscious of your tone, and don't assume male intent. Just because someone gave away their credential doesn't mean they personally hate you, for example. They could just be asking a family member to get a personal dog. They could be a, in a very hot position, and this seems to be the way out. Many factors, many factors can be easily <coughs> misassumed, so be sure, hypothesis, and prove, don't assume. Next, we have one notably different detection pattern. This one is forgery. Um, as Troy mentioned previously, we have the Storm 0558 case from the last year as an example. At a high level, we can think of the attack in a similar way to that particular case. Normally, an IDP will query a key material stored in, uh, in a storage device to sign a credential. This is where highly sensitive key material is typically stored. But then an attacker might use a foothold to compromise or leak the key material somehow and then exfiltrate the key material to their C2 infrastructure. And the key material can be used to create and sign a credential out of band of the canonical IDP. And then they can provide the credential to authenticate themselves, which the IDP would recognize as cryptographically valid and grant access. And this is the whole flow. To detect this type of attack, let's take a look at some logs. Let's say we have time extending down. We have two streams of events from the standard credential workflows. We have a creation stream and the usage stream. Both streams should have a unique ID for each generated credential, such that we can map every usage event back to exactly one creation event that happened in the past. With this premise holds true, we can then check for the violation of this condition. And this is basically what the, use, um, the usage of a forged credential look like. A credential usage event with, without a corresponding creation event. We don't have the creation event because the attacker minted the credential out of band, and it wasn't created by the canonical IDP, which writes the log. Having said that, there are some underlying assumptions and limitations for this detection that we haven't mentioned so far. 
So the first thing is our pattern here assumes that the forged credentials are generated out of the band, out of band by the attacker, and then used against the canonical IDP. So the system that issues the credential does not retain the state of any generated creds. So the credibility of the presented identity is solely established based on the valid validity of the crypt cryptographic signature. And then secondly, the credentials here cannot be forged online, i.e. the IDP itself is not vulnerable to any exploits that affect credential generation. So the integrity of the generation process is strong and we can trust it. In terms of the limitations of this detection, this detection pattern requires logging to be as close to 100% accurate and complete as possible. For example, if we don't have a credential creation event, we need to be sure um, like it's not a log loss somewhere. An alternative to this is state statefulness. Um, if the IDP itself, the server side, maintains states for the issued credentials, we can then just check the state machine for a given credential to ensure its authenticity and alert on any invalid credentials being presented to the system. And I'll ha hand back to Troy about what to do about these detections. Thank you. All right. So you can imagine if some of these detections fire, we obviously want to do something about it, right? Um, so. You might be wondering, tangentially to this, why not just detect all things like info stealing malware? Um, well, the problem is there's just so many ways to steal credentials, and we often have quite not that much control over how and where they're stored. Trying to detect all of the theft options here can be really expensive, time consuming, and also highly variant, meaning a lot of this can be hard to write. But there's a very small number of places where the credentials that we're talking about are used, validated, and checked. And these are all like core identity providers. And we also have, much, typically at least, we have much more control over those core IDPs, um, as well as where and how they log things. So we can implement detections basically at the choke point and save time and effort there with greater accuracy rather than trying to solve the malware execution case, for example. That being said, this isn't to say that we shouldn't do anything, obviously, except write, write rules looking at IDPs, right? Like detection in depth is still a completely valid concept here. In the same way that we want multiple detections to fire for badness, we don't want this one coup de gras detection rule to fire in, in the worst case either. OK, let's say we've detected some credential abuse and we know it's legit. Like now, what do we do? And we've probably already answered questions such as, where was the credential generated? Was it generated out of band? Which user was it account, uh, account was it tied to? How was it stolen? How we just, did we suspect it was stolen? How was the user potentially complicit? Things like this. But we still have a lot of questions to answer. Like we need to determine the impact. Like how widespread was the activity that we saw? What did the, the credential do post compromise? And then we need to figure out what to do next. We have to first of all figure out, is the credential still even valid? Um, and if so, when do we kick out the attacker? And then what do we do next? Like, do we need to like urgently fix something, even as like just a stopgap fix, or do we like e urgently need to deploy additional controls? And what do we do later? Like, do we have to fundamentally fix something? Do we have to fundamentally deploy more controls? Really fundamentally rework our application of identity? And this is this last one's probably overkill for the most part, but many an Active Directory forest has re been rebuilt for this very reason. But at the end of the day. If it's the user credentials that have been compromised, we always have to be cognizant of the human in the picture. We mentioned before the need not to assume situations when investigating suspected credential abuse. Um, we don't want to assume the intent, the circumstances, because log data does not contain the entire context of existence. Users might be complicit for reasons beyond their control, so we really can't always assume a malintent here. We should be sure of what's going on and then act upon it. As Kathy mentioned before, we should, we're probably going to have some hypotheses which we should be able to reasonably prove. But then we should take action only after we've done that. Obviously, here, a strong security culture, blameless culture, all of these things are really worthwhile investments because we need to acknowledge that all of us, including the users that we're protecting, are on the same side. And we need to work together to make this problem harder for the attacker. Because really, you don't want to be the security team that's feared. This makes collaboration significantly more difficult and fundamentally makes it harder to build trust with the very things you're trying to, to protect, including your user base. So then we're going to talk about a few controls quickly. We talked about credential binding as an example here. Um, but statefulness, Kathy mentioned, is, is a really good example. If you can track the state of a credential, then we can validate its state when presented back to us and invalid, invalidate sessions where we see an invalid state transition. And this requires the attacker to be A, aware of a state machine and of the credentials given state in a point of time within that state machine, which is very hard to do unless you're internal. We can also start automating exploration or forced reauthentication processes. These are good in theory, 
Um, but you know, if, if the initial authentication challenge is weak or fishable, then the attacker might already have fished all of the components that they need to be able to pass the checks. We also especially need to consider usability when it comes to controlling credential abuse. If we challenge too often or if the challenge effort is too high, then users are going to start working against us. And usability here is really a function of the challenge overhead we're implementing, the frequency at which we present it, and the actual effectiveness of the control. And we need to get this function right to avoid overburdening the user. Human exploration and remediation, these are kind of like the um, actions that may be taken by someone who investigates one of these incidents. Sometimes you might need to know more before a control kicks in. But the challenge here is to know when to act. Um, with, this can really vary by the user that's being targeted, the processes in place. But we don't want to alert the attacker or inconvenience the user. And this is a hard balance to strike. But we also don't want the attacker to progress too far either. So there's a very delicate balance in making these decisions. But this doesn't mean, however, uh, sorry, this does mean, however, that we can be considerate of what is appropriate given the user's needs. Just want to talk about obscurity before we close out. Um, it's obviously a meme to like solely rely on, on obscurity. Um, but an attacker doesn't know what they're up against. So a single OPSEC failure can often lead to detection. If they don't know all of the impossible travel data endpoints, uh, data points, sorry, or if they don't know the binding mechanism, or if they don't consider user working patterns or something, and they guess and they fail, that's when you can detect the weirdness. It's obviously a note to not solely rely on obscurity, right? But like, don't discount it in reality, because if we implement a control with high complexity, which is as, tra as transparent as possible to the user, this forces the attacker to make a leap of faith. And we want the attacker to guess, and we want that guess to be really hard. But to conclude really quickly, um, we talked about some core tenets of credentials and the importance of logging. And remember that your detections are only as good as your logging. Um, we hope this has kind of helped further the understanding of some of the detection patterns we've talked about today and some of the complexities involved in implementing this logic, um, as well as within reason how we can overcome some of these challenges. For those of you on the red side, um, common attacker techniques that you might think about may not always be as effective as you think, like VPNing to a local network range, for example. But nonetheless, we still see credentials being abused in the wild. But we hope that the attacker needs to tread lightly. That's the whole premise here. The detections and controls we discuss can introduce uncertainty into their operations, which gives us a greater chance of finding the badness. And finally, if one such control fires, your detection team should likely be interested. If a control exists for a reason, so even if the risk is mitigated, how did you find yourselves in the position where a control had to fire? That should be the question your detection team should be trying to answer. And finally, 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 um, if you're interested in one such project to make credential abuse harder, um, and which gives us actually really good opportunities to detect this sort of stuff, we suggest looking up um, device-bound session credentials. And um, this is a control um, underway. It's being designed and implemented the mo at the moment by a bunch of folks looking to make this thing particularly hard. Um, but we don't want to spoil it in this talk. Um, so feel free to look it up afterwards. And in the meantime, thank you for your time. Questions? It's got to be questions. Nice. Yeah, all questions. Good. Oh, sorry. Somebody was standing up behind me, so I thought it was him. Um, thank you. That was great. Uh, I have two questions. I'm kind of just curious about your thoughts on. One was to do the kinds of things you're talking about for a single event is you know something a human can run down. But when you've got a large enterprise mm. with hundreds of these, that well, I mean thousands of things happening that you might want to look into. Obviously, you have to have an enormous amount of automation. Mm. I'm curious about your thoughts about that. And the other thing I'm curious about is. Most organizations have scores of different types of, uh, you know, uh, authentication systems, mm -hmm. um, and hardening them all and monitoring them all is difficult. You might be tempted, lots of us do, to start to harmonize down to a single try, mm -hmm. but now everything is in one place. So if that gets popped, you're really screwed. I'm mm -hmm. kind of curious about your thoughts about that also. Good question. Do you want to take the automation one? Yeah, sure. Uh, so your first question is about how do we automate all these detections at scale, basically. Um, oops, too short. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, this is this really can be a different talk. Um, but like to summarize what can be done to automate things at scale, like for detection pipeline, we have like 
three main stages. We need to normalize the log, write detections, and add enrichment if possible, and finally automate the investigation as much as possible. Um, normalizing the logs is very, very important because that's the stage where we can make sure we have the data available, we have really good valid data, um, and it is structured in a way that we can use, use it. The detection part is also very important, obviously. Um, it's usually depends on the log volume. You might need to leverage some sort of data processing pipeline that supports a big data kind of scale processing. Um, and, and in the end of the day, it needs to be flexible enough to support different detection patterns. It can't just be like a filtering of certain thing you're looking for. It might need to support like batch lookup, streaming, streaming kind of ingestion, like comparing different windows of, of things. Like we can talk about the detection patterns later, but like to, to, to enable some of these detections, you usually need to ingest more than like a few data sources and the way they come in, they get delivered and how you can process them like varies very uh, quite a bit. Um, and finally, I guess we have um, we have enrichment. Um, this is where we can like auto close things at scale um, because like you said, lots of these things will happen like thousands, thousands of users will make all sorts of weird like what, what we think is weird anomalies in the, in the log, and now we would end up like not being able to investigate all of them. We would come up with criteria of like, how can we determine this is false positive, like really like confidently, and codify all of these and put that into the detection as well as enrichment, and then auto close as much of this as possible. So the only thing that gets surfaced to the queue is mostly like high fidelity um, uh, detections. Anyways, I will. More, kind of uh, we can have one, one or two more uh, questions. Just, just answer the second part of that one really quickly, actually. Yeah. Um, sorry to just interject real quick. Um, I think like the, the trade-off between like consolidation and siloing of identity providers is like, there's also another angle of like business requirement because some stuff you know you can't have in certain regions or whatever it might be. Um, I think first of all, if you have like sharded, you have to prioritize them. Like typically, I would say like look at the things that are known in the wider world first, right? If things can procure credentials to the wider world, that is you know well understood as an attack vector. Like I'd probably look at those first. Um, internally is also equally as important, but like there's a higher bar to meet, so maybe get around to those eventually, but not right away. Um, on the kind of like siloing versus like distribution problem, I think um, yeah, siloing makes it easier, but then you have to look at really all it does is shift the complexity from many systems into the specific subcomponents of one. And then you have more subcomponents in one than you did in the others. Um, it's just a, a different kind of complexity. You often have to have more knowledge across more things in the sharded sense of the model and have a lot more in-depth knowledge about the, the latter, which I don't have an answer for you. Basically, it's a trade-off at the end of the day. Thanks, though. Last one. Yep. Hi. Hi. Uh, given limited resources, where would uh, what's the best way to start? What's the, what's the lowest hanging fruit here, do you think? Mm -hmm. We'll give you a I can give it a go now. Wow. For me, like uh, maybe Troy has something different in mind, but like if you have unlimited amount of resources, uh, make sure you get access to as many data points as possible. That's usually quite hard, way harder than people would imagine, I think. Yeah. Managing stakeholder relationship and a lot of a lot of the times the data source comes from like external partners as well, which makes it even worse. I just turn it all off, you know, just don't let anyone log into anything. Uh, no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> Honestly, I think in limited resources, right, it's like, it's prioritize what you're detecting. I mean, it's a similar theme, unfortunately, so it's a bit of a cop out of an answer, but um, prioritizing what you need, right? It's like threat intelligence is great here. Like if you know what you're trying to detect, then just prioritize your resources towards those things if you can. Um, that may not always be possible for various nuanced reasons, but um, typically speaking, when you're looking at like, you really have to make a decision on if it's, you're gonna detect large amounts of low sophistication, high volume, or high, vo sorry, yeah, high sophistication, low volume in, in the inverse. If you're looking at like a lot of low sophistication attack vectors, then you're probably gonna look for a small number of log sources because most of your data is probably gonna land in like your core IDP logs. Inversely, if you're looking for like high sophistication, then you're probably looking at more log sources, but probably not looking as many events per log source. So it's kind of like the point I mentioned before about um, like log, diversity and log specificity. You have to probably have a trade-off between those two things. But that's a good question. Thank you. Okay, that was the last one. Thank you, Kathy and Troy. Uh, another round of applause. Thank you, folks.